Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for today's presentation, Making the Transition from Manual to Automated Testing. Our speaker today is Badri Nitor, who joins us from Eureka, where he is the co-founder and CEO. Badri brings with him a wealth of experience in helping clients move to automation is going, and is going to share his wisdom with us today. Before we get started, I just wanted to cover a few things. You have the ability to ask questions during the presentation using the Q&A box within the WebEx panel. I'll be monitoring those questions, so please submit them as Baudry speaking, um, and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. Um, also, we are recording this session, and we'll be sharing that with anybody who registered tomorrow. Um, we'll send both the recording and the slides. Um, but if you do have any additional questions or need anything from us, you can always email uh, webinar at softlabs.com. All right, with that, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay. Uh, thank you, Christina. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, excellent. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar on uh, making the transition, moving from manual to automated testing. As uh, Christina indicated, my name is Badri Nitur. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, Eureka. I have over 20 years experience building, testing, and managing uh, web-based applications in a variety of industries, and uh, I hope to uh, bring about some of that uh, experience in talking today about uh, migrating from uh, manual to automated testing. So what we're going to cover today is, you know, I like to do things in sets of threes. So in terms of making the transition, I'd like to first look at uh, what are the things that you need to do before you actually start automating any of your tests. And then we will look at once you have started, how do you keep this thing grow, going? Because you don't want to just start and stop. Then, if, And one other item which I think is near and dear to everybody, which is uh, selecting the right tool. We're going to talk about a few things you would consider there. And we're going to show you an example of uh, a testing platform, Eureka and uh, Sauce Labs. Then we'll open it up for Q&A. So first, before you begin, the first thing you want to do is plan. The assumption here is that you are experienced with manual testing. So you're doing a lot of manual testing, but before you automate, the first thing you have to figure out is the scope of your automation. What is it that you want to automate? And you can do that in one of a few ways. First, look at how frequently you run your tests. There are some tests that you run more frequently than others, so the tests that you run more frequently are likely to be more better candidates for automation because they're going to give you the more the higher savings in time. Then you have to look at your business and technical priority of your tests as well. You know, there, there could be certain critical business, critical workflows that need to be tested more frequently. You may want to automate that. Then finally, you also look at, uh, uh, you know, what can actually be automated. And not all the steps that you take undertake in manual testing can be automated. Certain things based on the tool you select may have to be done manually. So that's another factor to look at. Once you've done that, you also then look at organization of your tests. Typically, when you do your manual testing, it's very execution focused. You know, you're going to look at how am I going to run my tests and how am I going to, you know, run through the motions of testing something manually, and that's the way you're going to auto you're going to record your tests. But when you automate it, you want to be able to look at common workflow components that you can use across multiple tests, just like you would do with any programming exercise. Once you look at these common workflow components, you also need to uh, figure out what is the level of granularity you want to in, uh, have for reuse within your uh, test infrastructure. And that depends a lot about your application. You know, certain applications uh, may require you to go to a higher level of granularity than others. So that requires a good deal of subject matter expert and knowledge of your application. This has nothing to do with any programming language at all. Then the next step you would take on is actually separating data from workflow and business logic within your test. 
this is a very important piece when you're considering automation. And in order to be able to build good, scalable, and manageable automation, you really need to be able to separate out data. And by data, it could be anything that changes. It could be content, it could be data, it could be uh, or you know, any other information that varies or is different from the workflow of your application itself. Then finally, you also want to look at being able to tie in some traceability to your requirements and to changes. Because one of the primary reasons you're testing is something is changing in your application. It could be code, content, data, whatever, and that change could be crossed by something. So then the other piece that you also look at is looking at your own team and the tools that uh, you want to use to do your automation. Considering your team's strengths and capabilities is extremely important. You want to look at your existing team that does your manual testing and see if how they would make the transition to doing automation. Do they have the skills to do the automation? Do they, you know, are they really uh, programming savvy, in which case you could pick a tool that requires a high level of programming, or if they don't have the necessary programming skills, you might want to look, uh, you might want to pick tools and techniques that don't require as much of uh, programming uh, knowledge. So that is something that you have to work together with your team. And then look at the individual t tools itself. There are a number of tools available in the market, and uh, you want to look at the ones that suit your needs. For the purposes of this webinar, we're going to focus primarily on Selenium and uh, WebDriver and look at uh, testing web or browser-based applications, both on the desktop and on uh, mobile devices. So you want to look at how easy or effectively you can actually deploy the tool and what does it take to do that. And if you're considering uh, Selenium and WebDriver, as we're going to talk about, you have to remember that Selenium and WebDriver is not a full-blown uh, full blown tool like uh, you could look at some other uh, proprietary tool. So in order to really uh, get the benefit of, uh, leverage the benefit of being able to do testing with uh, Selenium and WebDriver, you would need something like what is typically called a framework, a testing framework. And we'll talk about that as well as to what is it that you should be looking for in these frameworks. So then once you have started your automation, how do you keep it going? So one of the key things that we have found when people are building automation with Selenium is there is this uh, invisible wall around uh, a 20 to 30, 35% automation level. When you get to that point, people typically hit a wall in wherein they are trying to do more automation, but they also have a lot of automation that they've already done that they now have to keep up to date as their application is changing. So it becomes important to make sure that whatever mechanism you use to do your test automation uh, is very easy, not only to do new automation, but also to keep your tests fresh and maintain them. Reuse becomes a critical part in this whole process, right? And then you have to incorporate your testing into your development process to really can uh, make sure that it can continue to be used and you get maximum value out of your testing earlier on in the testing process than later on. So capabilities like integrating with your DevOps, integrating with your continuation, continuous integration tools or issue tracking tools to make sure when you run your test automation, if there's a bug that's encountered, that's automatically logged into your issue tracking system. So making sure that you have all these capabilities really enhances your uh, test uh, capabilities and makes the transition to automation a lot easier. Then the next step, if you're doing manual testing, you have typically somebody that's do the tester is actually documenting the results. They may be capturing screenshots. They may, be, they may have a spreadsheet in front of them that tells them what the expected results should be, and they start notating what they actually see. And that process of documenting results and uh, making it available sometimes can take as much time in manual testing as the actual process of testing itself. So now we have to get to a greater, uh, with automation, you have the ability to 
capture a lot of results because this is done automatically or you know with a little bit of uh, uh, programming you can actually get a lot of the results but then you have to determine how detailed these results have to be what granularity you want to capture them in you want structured like expected versus uh, actual results or unstructured data like screenshots or videos then do you want to maintain historical data to compare against uh, you know past test executions to see what worked in the past and what worked right now so these are all decisions that you make uh, as you go along with your in your automation then finally uh, you know you need some kind of reporting and analytics since you have the ability to capture data easily with uh, automation you also have the ability to build in rich reporting different types of reporting but then you have to figure out what type of reports you want how frequently do you want to generate them what level of detail you want in them and who gets these reports so these are all questions that you have to think about answering as you get started in your automation journey so addressing these questions right you know even figuring out what to do before you start automation and doing these steps will help you make that move from manual to automation um, relatively easily and keep that process going so next we'll look at uh, a step that I think most people uh, are going to be interested in selecting a tool you know what do I where do I go how do I get started what product do I use or if I'm using selenium okay I'm going to go in and download uh, the open source uh, selenium uh, jars and API so what do I do from there so selenium driver has actually emerged as the preferred choice for automation of web applications but then there are challenges building automation with just selenium requires a set of specialized skills you need to know programming you need to be able to uh, you know learn the selenium API and then um, you know use it this is something that is sometimes a little challenging to uh, a lot of uh, QA analysts or manual testers that don't necessarily have the programming capability but want to make the transition to automation so these are factors that you consider while you select an automation tool then it's the selenium infrastructure itself right you can build your own selenium and browser infrastructure so one of the benefits of selenium is that and web driver is that you can test your application across multiple browsers you can simulate a user behavior or user testing across any browser or any uh, mobile web uh, device and uh, you know see how your application reacts to it so if you want to test all of this you can build your own infrastructure in your own little lab or your company but that takes time that takes you know you have to get the servers up or virtual machines up you got to get your network infrastructure set up you got to download the various uh, versions of uh, selenium and then the, you know keep your browser and operating system up uh, versions up to date if you're using chrome that changes pretty much on a monthly basis firefox is not much better and uh, with selenium again keeping the jars up to date probably you got to do that every quarter and if you're doing it for a variety of browsers and operating systems that pretty much becomes a, a good sized effort pretty soon or you could use somebody like sauce labs which as you most of you know has a, a, very, a large volume of a variety of combinations of browsers and devices on the cloud so you can do it in a secure reliable and scalable manner so now you've figured out say you start off doing something uh, on with selenium doing some programming and then you start working with uh, uh, sauce labs on the cloud the question still remains on how do you do what does it take to really build automation with selenium so I'm going to try to address that in the next couple of slides so typically when you start doing your automation you're going to pick a language a favorite language of your choice with selenium you're going to pick you know Java uh, Python or PHP and then start writing some of your test code you might start storing that into a source code repository say on git or something uh, and then you could probably do some scheduling of your test runs you could use something like uh, uh, test ng and uh, then run your tests on a local browser 
But then to do all of this, you need a team of programmers. You probably need some system and network administration staff to help you set up your um, Selenium uh, infrastructure and your hardware and uh, network infrastructure and so on. So let's say you get past this. You, you automate a few tests. You get to the next stage. Now you want to start building capabilities like keyword-driven and data-driven testing. If you recall, we talked about separating out data from workflows that allows you to run your tests across a, a different variety of data sets. In order to do that, you might want to build out a uh, data-driven uh, infrastructure. You also want to be able to build in the ability to notify different people either via email or SMS or different mechanisms when a test starts or when a test fails and so on. You may want to connect to the uh, Source Labs infrastructure. So you want to be able to, uh, if you have your servers, your application running within your firewall, you can use Source uh, Labs uh, secure tunnel connecting capability to uh, uh, connect to your servers. You can also build various reports. So now this whole effort of doing all this automation has become more than just doing testing, right? It's become becoming a programming effort. Now you're doing some heavy-duty programming. You probably even have a project manager because this becomes a second development effort within your own organization. Not only are you actually building and test, building your application, now you're building another piece of software to test that application. So then when you start doing even more than that, you can start building more uh, you know, dashboards and user management functionality, and you're building a full-fledged test automation framework. So that's what it takes, really, to build an effective test automation framework. So some of this sometimes can be a little daunting, right? To say, do I really want to get into all of these? But there are other options available if you don't want to start building all of this, but still want to make the move from manual to automated testing. So we're going to talk about some of that right now. So as I said, all of this can become very expensive very quickly if you don't pay attention to it. So we're going to talk about what would a fully featured framework look like and working with a scalable Selenium infrastructure. So I'm going to take an example. We're going to do a quick demo of uh, a testing platform, Eureka, which has a lot of these capabilities, and you'll see how it is to use that. So going into working with Eureka with Source Labs, the way Eureka works is first you author your tests with a tool called QA Scribe. For the folks that are familiar with uh, Selenium, QA Scribe is built on top of the Selenium IDE. It's a modified version of the IDE, so it's a Firefox plugin. It allows you to record your test scripts. But then, with unlike just the regular Selenium IDE, QA Scribe allows you to record scripts and store them in small reusable segments in a script library. The script library is on the Eureka SaaS application, and you'd store all your scripts in the library. So when you want to create a test scenario, like say I want to uh, create a workflow wherein I'm going to simulate or test the shopping experience on an e-commerce site, I would just take the appropriate scripts and drag and drop them into the order in which I want them to run. So that would just create my scenario without doing any, using any programming. So I would then take that test scenario and run it against this uh, source cloud. Again, I can pick the browser or device that I want and then run the test and have my results. And the results are available at a fine level of granularity at each in Selenium instruction level. And you also have the ability to get screenshots and uh, videos, the unstructured data that we were talking about. Eureka also gets you the Selenium logs that are available on uh, the Source Labs infrastructure. And you also have the ability to notify different uh, people when the tests uh, run, pass, or fail. And you have integrations with issue tracking systems like JIRA. So if you are using JIRA, you can automatically log a bug in JIRA from Eureka. We also provide uh, integration with uh, CI tools, with Jenkins and Bamboo. And so once you do your uh, deployment, you can automatically trigger tests within the Eureka infrastructure, and the test gets run on Source Lab, and you have any issues that are automatically logged into your issue tracking system. We also have a rich API interface where you can 
trigger test, you can check on the status of a test, and you can download test results. So I'm going to go into a quick uh, demo here and show you how you would actually do all of this with uh, Eureka. So we're going to take a simple scenario. <laughs> I love to use uh, Amazon. It's, you know, it's a great e-commerce application that you can test a variety of capabilities. So we're going to look for a book on Amazon. We're going to verify certain attributes like ISBN number, author, publisher, etc. Then we're going to add that book to the cart. We're going to verify that the book has been successfully added to the cart. Then we're going to go to the cart and we're going to delete that book. So that's a very simple scenario. So I'm going to show you how you do that with Eureka. And then I'm going to show you how you can repeat the same thing for a number of different books. So that would show you data-driven testing. Then we'll also show you how you do automated cross-browser and cross-device testing, taking the same test and running it across multiple browsers and devices. And then we will go into uh, reports and analytics and look at some of the reports uh, available within Eureka. So I'm going to jump into the demo right now. So Eureka, I'm going to log out of here. Eureka is a SaaS application. So I'm going to first log in. And for the purpose of this demo, I'm going to first show you how you would assemble a scenario from existing test script. So Eureka is a multi-tenant system for you. Each customer gets their own little domain that you would work on. You can have any number of projects and users. I'm going to go to the project that I want to use here, which is called Amazon Public Site Testing. Right? And I'm going to create a scenario here. So this is a list of, list of scenarios that I have, but I'm going to create a new one. I'm going to call it Webinar Demo Scenario. And down here in my script library, I have a number of scripts that I have already created. And I'll come back and show you how we create these scripts without doing any programming. So I can cr select the scripts that I want to add into my scenario. So I'm going to look for the active scripts. I can store different versions of the scripts. I can tag the scripts with different labels as well. So this is a great way for me to organize the data and the scripts in my script library. So I'm going to go and search. I'm going to search for a book that gets, as soon as I select that, that gets added to the bottom here. Then I want to run the script that actually verifies the details in the product. I'm going to verify the quantity of the product in the cart. I want to add the product to the cart. So all I'm doing here is I'm doing a quick search that picks up the uh, scripts that are available. And then I can delete. So as I select these scripts, they get added down here into the scenario. So the, I'm formulating my scenario just as I showed you in the PowerPoint. Uh, you know, I'm just formulating this scenario from existing scripts. So when I look at this, I'm first selecting a product, I'm verifying the details, then I'm verifying the quantity in the cart. That doesn't look right. I got to actually add the product to the cart first. So I can just drag this and drop it before that. So I got the sequence right now. So I can, I've added the product to the cart. I verify it in the cart and then I delete it. So that's it, my scenario is complete. But how do I know that this actually works? So to do that, I actually run the scenario once and see how it works. So I'm gonna save that and I'm gonna take it through a set process called validation, where I first set a testing context. This is where I tell Eureka how I wanna test the uh, scenario. So in this case, I can actually, in Eureka, I can create any number of environments. So I may have my application running on my dev server, my QA server, my staging, my production server. I can create one set of scripts and I can run them on any one of these servers. So I'm gonna look, I'm gonna run it on the QA server and I'm gonna select the Sauce Labs cloud that I wanna run it on. So once I select the cloud platform, I'm gonna say I wanna run it on the Sauce Labs cloud and it tells me what devices are available on the Sauce Cloud. And all this information is coming from Sauce Labs. So I'm gonna select the desktop and I'm gonna get a list of desktop operating systems that are available. So you don't need to do any of this programming. It's already all built in. So I'm gonna select Windows 8.1 and I'm gonna select Chrome. And I can select the screen resolution I want. And I have the option of doing screen captures. I can do screen capture for every instruction, every interaction I have with the server, I can do it in real time, or I can do it at the end of the uh, test, or I can do it only if there's an error 
for the purpose of this demo, I'm going to just do it, say, show me in real time all the uh, uh, screenshots. I'm also going to get video capture. I'm going to select Selenium logs and the cloud logs as well. These are all going to come from Sauce Labs at this time. So I'm going to save that. So that creates a testing context where I want to run the test. I can also notify different uh, folks on this, uh, you know, when this test runs. So I'm going to uh, select one of my teammates here, and I'm going to say he also has to get notified. So I've got two people being notified when this test runs. So I'm going to select this, and I'm going to execute. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when I do this, Eureka takes those individual scripts that are uh, used in the library and then assembles them into a single test scenario and prepares this test and sends it over to the execution engine to be executed, to be run. So uh, the test is now scheduled to be run. So we have a job that you know runs every so often, picks it up, queues the test to be run, fires up a VM on uh, SAS Labs, and starts the test execution. So you can see the results of the test execution here. So you can see the individual scripts that we have selected. And I'll come back and show you how we create these scripts. But for those of you that are familiar with uh, Selenium, you can see it has the same command target value uh, pattern. And it tells you every you know, how long it takes to run each script. And you can actually click on this and look at the screenshots right then and there as it is running. So we're going to let this run through. And you can see that it's actually running on Sauce Labs. It's uh, running on the QA environment on a Windows 8.1 uh, operating system with Chrome. And yet you're actually capturing screenshots and videos. So as you can go through, you can see that now you're validating various items on the screen. You're actually looking up the product title on here. You know, I'm looking for a book called Good to Great, and I'm verifying that it, I've actually selected the right book. I'm actually, then once I have verified, I've added it to the cart, and now I'm going to finish up the test where it's deleting the item from the cart. So once it runs through the test successfully, it's going to say that these, uh, you know, the test passed completely. I can actually drill down here, and I can look at each step in detail where I'm looking at you know, I'm verifying the 10-digit and 13-digit ISBN number. I'm verifying who the author is and so on. So all this is great. Right now, what I've done is my workflow here, my test workflow and my test data is tightly coupled. In this case, what that means, typically when you do a record and replay, you can only replay what you have recorded, right? In this case, when I built my initial scripts, I searched for a book called Good to Great. And then I verified that I had the right author and the publisher for that. Now, what if I want to check a different uh, book, if I want to check a different uh, author? So what I would do is, if I've separated my data, I would have that data in, say, an Excel spreadsheet or a CSV file, and that I can load into Eureka. So I would, I'm going to look at a file that I've already loaded here, I'm going to look at my data files, and here's the data file that I have already loaded, right? So I have my expected data, my search keywords, I mean my input data, and my expected results, the ISBN number, test results, book title, author, etc., that are already in there. So now, if I want to run the same test against these, how do I do? To do that, I would actually take the scripts that I have already created and parameterize them to be able to allow them to read data from, these, from this data file. So let me show you how we do that. So I'm going to a scripts section here. Say I have a script here called verify product details. It's very similar to the other one that I use. And I'm going to edit it. So if you look at it, this is the same thing. I'm actually verifying that uh, I'm using, I found the book good to great. And here's the author, and this is the 10-digit ISBN number. But in order to actually bind to that file, what I do is I select a data definition. The data definition is nothing but uh, the metadata for the data file that I'm loading in. So I'm going to select a pre-created data definition. Say I'm going to say expanded book data definition. And then now I can go and edit this particular command. And in here, 
um, I say in the value, instead of using the ISBN that was already recorded, pick the 10-digit ISBN from the data file, right? And I can save that. I do the same thing again for the 13-digit. I say pick the 13-digit ISBN from the data file. Another thing to note here, again, you see this, the same format for every instruction. You have the command target value format. But a neat thing with Eureka is with the target, we actually, when we record, when we build these scripts, we get all the locators that are available in the DOM in your application. And so we can actually uh, figure out as we go across different browsers, we can select which locator we want to use and use those, and, and Eureka automatically figures those out. And in some applications, if you want to be able to add a new way of locating uh, an element to say, okay, I don't want, I want an element that is actually next to another element, you can add your own custom locator. You just say, add locator, and you can create your, write your own little JavaScript here if you may. These are more advanced capabilities, but Eureka provides the support for that. So for the purpose of this, I'm just going to go back and uh, pick the expat and uh, save this. So I can now go in and make this change for every one of these uh, scripts, so every one of these instructions. So I can do that either at the value, or actually I can even go in and select that at uh, the target. So I can make this more like keyword-driven testing rather than just data-driven testing. So I can come in here again and uh, select the author. And I'm going to quickly select the publisher and the language. And I'm going to be done with this. So at this point, I have created my data bindings. So what I would do is I can now, if I go to the scenarios and I look at the same scenario that I just created, I will notice that this particular script that I just modified has two icons here. One is for me to pick the, the original script, or I can pick the parameterized version of the script. So if you notice, each one of these scripts that I have selected previously in the uh, scenario have already been parameterized. I have done that before. So now I can go to this uh, scenario here, and I can, e I can actually replace the original script with the parameterized version of the script by just clicking here. So as I go through and click, you will see that there's an icon that shows here saying that this particular script is bound to some attributes. So once I do that, and now if I go and validate it, Eureka automatically now knows that you're by, you want to read a file and says, okay, I expect that I'm going to have to run through these tests multiple times for each record in this file. So it says, do you want me to figure it out by myself, how I want to do it? That's implicit data looping. Or do you want to figure it out explicitly? So for now, I'm going to say just keep the implicit looping. So when I do that, it automatically creates this loop and say, okay, I want to be able to uh, you know, loop all of these for every record in uh, the uh, data file. I can also build nested loops. The support is there, but we don't have the need right now. So I'm going to go ahead and validate this once again with data-driven testing. So now you see that the validation screen is a little different. Now it's, uh, Eureka figures out that you want to actually uh, tie in a data file and asks you to pick the data file. So I'm going to go ahead and select the data file, and it automatically now allows me to go into my testing context. I also have the ability to stop my execution if I run into multiple errors. So sometimes you might be doing running this test for a data file that has tens of thousands of records, but if they have if there's a problem with your script or an application, you may not want you may not want to run it for everything. So you can say after I have about three or four failures, just stop the execution. So you have fine grained control built within the tool. So this is the same uh, testing context that we have previously created. I'm going to select that, and I'm going to execute. So now, again, it goes through the same uh, step, where it takes the individual scripts, prepares the scenario, but it does one additional step right now. It also reads in that data file that you want to upload, and I mean, that you want to run the test for, and it runs the test for it. So you can see that in this case, it's picked the data file, 
And since we're just validating here, it's only going to run it for the top three records. So it's going to show you the first time where it's running it on the first record, and then it's going to run it on the second record and the third record and so on. So you will see for the first one, it's even though the original script was looking for good to great, in my data file, the first record I had was I was searching for Bill Gates' biography. So that's what it's going to go and search for right now. So if you look at this, it, it, as you go to the next screen, and you can see it actually pulls up the uh, book for uh, Bill Gates' biography. So it's that easy and straightforward to build uh, data-driven testing within Eureka. So I'm going to let this run through and then go to the next step where I'll show you how you actually run automated cross-browser testing, right? So to do that, you create what we call a run definition, and I've created one here, and I'm going to edit this run definition. This run definition is nothing but a collection of scenarios. So it, you can think about it as a test suite that executes a number of test scenarios in one go. So I can select multiple test scenarios uh, here and uh, show them, or I can just, just go with one for now. I'm just going to go with a single test scenario, and I want to run it. And Eureka allows you to create any number of testing contexts. So I have created multiple testing contexts here, and I want to select them and say, go run these tests. So I'm going to run this first one on uh, an iOS uh, device, an uh, iPad uh, uh, tablet device and Safari, and I'm going to write, run Mac OS X and Safari, Windows uh, 8.1 and IE, and Windows and Chrome, and Windows and Firefox. I'm running five different tests, and I'm going to say execute them. So Eureka does the same thing. It takes the, that scenario or those sets of scenarios, prepares all of them, and sends them over to uh, the source cloud. And in here, you can see what it's doing is actually it's running all of these in parallel, right? So this specific, what it do, this you can run any number of tests in parallel. The only dep uh, dependency is the number of VMs you have with uh, Sauce or the amount of, uh, you know, uh, level of subscription you would have with Eureka. So if I jump now to Chrome, I can see that the test execution has started in the Chrome browser. And I can actually now jump into, say, Firefox and see that the test is in progress on Firefox as well. I can jump in between different ones. This is OSX and uh, Safari. And I can even look at uh, iOS. So it's still cute. iOS takes a little while to get started up. but uh, So this way, you can actually run any number of these. And you can see here, IE test is actually completed at this point. So all of these uh, tests that you have uh, you know, what I have manually executed here, manually scheduled to run, you can also execute through our CI integration, and you can also run it through our REST API. So you can trigger this directly from uh, your CI tools, and you would just pass on an identifier here that's shown up here, and that would execute that specific test. So when you look at the uh, home page here, you would see the results of the tests that are being executed. So you can see these tests are being run. So if I go back to a test that was completed previously here, here's a test that uh, I ran uh, earlier today, and I'm going to look at it. And I ran multiple scenarios in this. You can see there are four scenarios that were run. We have the ability to actually drill down and look at the details. In this case, I was looking for different books in this scenario. And in this, the other scenario here, as I was actually going into a different language sites and verifying data in different languages. So in here, I was actually going in into a Chinese language version of Amazon and verifying data there, all through data-driven testing. So I can actually download my test results. You know, we talked about reports and so on. I can download it into an Excel report. As soon as the test is executed, I can pull up that Excel file, and I can see a summary of the test I can also see the details of every instruction that was run and you know when it started, when it ended, and how long that particular instruction took. If I'm doing data-driven testing, I can actually look at each one of the data files that I use and get the status of the test for those uh, particular data records, executions. I can even look at, say, 
a language file and actually look at uh, different language versions of uh, uh, Amazon that I ran this test on and I can see if it passed or failed. So there's a lot of uh, detail in here. I can close that out. I can also download a PDF version of that. In the PDF version, you can also include screenshots. So if you're actually creating a, a report at the end of uh, your test for your user community, say doing user acceptance testing, that's an evidence that you can provide to say the tests was, were executed correctly and include screenshots with it. You can also look at uh, videos. You know, with, this is a great feature with uh, Sauce Labs. You can actually run the video of the test and actually look at the entire test execution here. You can actually move ahead and look at how the test was actually running. So all these capabilities are built and available out of the box with the tools. So you don't have to build any new features. All you're focusing on is doing automation. So with that, let me come quickly down to the point of uh, seeing how we would actually do the automation. As I indicated, you know, Eureka is a uh, uh, QA Scribe is uh, an extension of the Selenium IDE. For the folks that uh, already use it, you will find it familiar. So I'm launching QA Scribe here, and I'm just authenticating to my domain. And once I log in, it's, it turns on the uh, uh, recording, and I just go in and I just start searching for a book. So I'm going to say, I'm going to look for Agile testing. So, and if, you, if I look at QA Scribe here, it's recording every one of these steps. So then I would take that in and say, okay, if I want to verify that I found the right book, I right click on it, I verify the text. I can go in and click on this, and I can verify the author. I can even come down here and verify the 10-digit and 13-digit ISBN numbers. These are exactly the same things that you saw us do in the other scripts, right? I can do that. And what I'm combining here is what we have done across multiple scripts in Eureka. Fine, you know, ideally, you want to actually break these down into smaller scripts. But in the interest of time, I'm just showing you how we would actually do this. So once you do this, you actually see that we capture all the available locators within uh, this script uh, here. And you can just save this test script. Okay, I'm just going to save it on the desktop. And then I would go into Eureka, and I would just enter this. I would just load this test script into Eureka. So when I load this in, I also have the ability to tie it into certain modules and functional requirements for my application. So this helps me build traceability. To, so I can say, show me all the uh, uh, test cases that have to do with uh, searching for a book. So I'm going to save this. And now this test case is available in my script library. It's that straightforward. And this, I can actually go in here and edit each one of these scripts. So if I don't want this open command here, I can just go in and delete that. I can actually uh, click on this, and I, I can look at all the, you saw that all the locators are already captured in here. So it provides a lot of those capabilities. And it's pretty straightforward to uh, automate, build your uh, initial tests. So one final feature, we talked about reports. One other capability is uh, analytics. So when you look at, when you run your tests, you want to be able to look not just on your current test results, but uh, you also want to be able to look at your historical test results. So I'm going to say I am being, I've been running this particular scenario uh, or run definition multiple times. I want to go back and look at uh, how this has performed over time. So I can actually click on this little link icon here, and that takes me to the analytics, and it shows me how my test has performed in the last, say, 24 hours. I'm going to say in the last seven days, and I'm going to say go uh, and run this. And as I'm running this, I can see how it has performed across various browsers and, you know, how many times it passed or failed, different uh, 
environments, products, different users. I can drill down into different uh, uh, scripts that were used within that uh, scenario. I can drill down and then look at the results just for that particular script. I can also go in here and look at results just for a specific operating system or by a specific browser. So I can slice and dice the data any which way I want. So there's a lot of information that is already available within Eureka and these analytics help you get to uh, you know, a lot of detail uh, on your uh, tests. So these are the kind of things that you want on, uh, you know, in, in a framework uh, to make your uh, testing process really easy. What this allows you to do right now is not really worry about the pro programming aspect of automation, but really emphasizes on how you create your script. What should be a script? How do you get uh, you know, granularity or a level of reuse within your uh, um, automation. How do you, you know, what scenario should you use? What kind of data do you want to use? These are more value-added domain-specific uh, capabilities that now you have to focus on, and that's where, as uh, QA analysts and engineers, I believe that, you know, you bring real value to the uh, testing process. The things that you would typically do in manual testing, you're able to take that into the automation domain and not have to worry about uh, the nuances of, uh, you know, how do I make certain thing work or, or not when it's with a specific tool. So that's the end of my demo. I'm going to give the, a quick uh, last slide here before I open it up for Q&A. And... Uh, some more information. This slides we will be sharing these uh, uh, with uh, the participants of the uh, webinar and anybody that has registered for the webinar. I believe they should, as Christine said, they should be available uh, tomorrow. And we are also offering a free trial of uh, Eureka. And uh, for the folks that enter in a promo code webinar uh, by the next, by the end of this month, you will get one full month of uh, free trial. Typically, it's two weeks. We're extending it to a month. And also, there's a link here to sign up for a free trial of uh, the Source Labs Cloud. One other thing in this uh, PowerPoint here, I have a few other slides that talk about a few other features. I'm not going to go through these right now, but they will be available in the slide deck uh, that will be sent to you, uh, that, that will be made available to you. So with that, I'm going to open it up for uh, Q&A, uh, Christina, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to uh, take them. Yeah, definitely. we got a lot of questions. So we'll cover as many as we can in the next 10 minutes, um, and then we will have Badri respond to um, a few um, after the webinar if we can't get to them. So I'm going to go ahead and dive in. Um, what is the best practice for how many browser-based tests you should automate versus doing unit tests? I wouldn't, it's not an either or question. I believe unit testing is a must. It is something that you do much earlier on in the process. Where you would do cross browser testing is really where you want to look at the user, or what I call the user journey through your application. Looking at the overall, how a user interacts with the application and flows through it, and a lot of those that user experience or the issues that are uncovered during that may not come up during unit testing, right? Because it, in, in itself, a unit of your code may work great, but when combined with something else, it may break. So I would say, you know, there are two different things, but in terms of how much uh, cross-browser testing you would do, that completely depends on your audience. You know, we've had customers that just use uh, have all their users use just uh, IE8 or IE9, and that's the only platform uh, browser that they test on. We have others that test on over 10 different uh, browsers. So you want to be able to get to a combination on where you actually test your functionality initially on one browser and then look for specific cross-browser tests, so which is probably going to be a smaller subset of your test that go across different browsers. Okay, great. Um, is it possible to run scripts locally on my laptop? 
So with QA Scribe, you can run your scripts locally, right? So if I go back in here, so this is the capability within QA Scribe. So I can go in here and I can say run, and it's going to run this right here on your laptop. But what it does there is really limiting. You cannot run the real power of Eureka is in the SaaS and the cloud application, right? With QA Scribe, you're restricted to Firefox. So you can probably do about 10, 20% of your testing with this, but really a lot of the capabilities like data-driven testing, the cross-browser testing capabilities, all of that come in on the uh, cloud. Okay, great. Yeah, we had a lot of questions asking very similar things about, you know, can I use this on internal websites? Can yes, you I can. run it on a Let's, local browser? So lots of questions about how do I do this locally? Sure, okay, there are two different questions. So that, uh, I think yeah. I see it. Your question is can I run this script on the local machine and that's what uh, mm -hmm. I said, you know, you would you yeah. do it with QA Scribe. However, if your application is, say, behind a firewall or is internal uh, to your uh, network, you can still test it with Eureka. You can, Sauce Labs provides a secure tunnel mechanism to connect in a secure way to the Sauce Cloud and run your tests. So we can leverage that to send the test traffic from browsers running on the Sauce Cloud in a secure manner to applications that are running on servers inside your network. Okay, perfect. Thank you for clarifying. Um, there's a couple questions um, more specifically around like writing the scripts or translating scripts. So somebody asked, do you have pointers for converting Selenium IDE scripts to WebDriver? And then other questions are kind of around the same topic is also around false positives and you know how you avoid um, those scenarios as well. Okay. So one of the things we do within Eureka, which is, you know, which is kind of like the uh, secret sauce that uh, you know goes on under the cover, is every time what you see here as uh, a single instruction within uh, Eureka can actually be a number of different steps that we uh, handle internally. So what you get, are seeing here is something that was recorded. Within the within QA Scribe, or you may think of it as within the Selenium IDE, but internally the Eureka test engine converts these into WebDriver uh, commands, WebDriver instructions, and uh, every time you run on a specific browser, you're actually running native WebDriver code on each of those uh, browsers. So we take care of all the uh, inherent flakiness that's there in Selenium and WebDriver and minimize that significantly. Things like hand, being able to handle AJAX objects, waiting for page loads, you know, way, you know, handling if an object has moved around on the screen, whether it's visible or not, whether it's you know, hidden behind another element or not. So all of these things we can handle within the Eureka code. So we kind of minimize all of that uh, additional effort that uh, comes in to anybody that programs with Selenium uh, you know, in this framework. That's what a good framework should do, actually. It should really make you more yeah. productive rather than handling the mundane tasks of just yeah. programming. Yep, okay, perfect. Um, we have a couple questions about security, um, mm -hmm. mainly because both of these solutions you're speaking about are in the cloud. Um, mm -hmm. So can you address any security concerns? Sure. So uh, Sauce Labs, as you know, is in a very secure uh, data center, a highly secure data center, and the uh, Sauce Connect, uh, the you know, capability that you have is a secure tunnel that can connect to your internal servers. And I'm sure uh, Sauce Labs can vouch for uh, a number of uh, customers that have put their solution through the ringer to uh, make sure that it is secure. And um, you know, we, have, we have a lot of uh, uh, customers in industries that are very security conscious. With Eureka itself, it's also in a similar tier one data center uh, in the US, 
and uh, in a very secure uh, uh, location. And you have the ability within all your tests to encrypt your uh, data. So if you look at, <coughs> excuse me, within your uh, QA scribe here, if I'm, say, looking, verifying this text, I can actually go in, if I don't want somebody to see this, I can actually go in and uh, encrypt it. And when I load the script, it's, this data is stored in an encrypted manner within Eureka and everywhere else. Nobody can actually see what is in this. But the application, the tests still work fine because it will actually look at what's on the screen, uh, you know, decrypt this, do the comparison, and then sh show you the results. So uh, I believe somebody is asking uh, for an encryption algorithm there. I believe it's MD5. I'm not sure I can, we can get you that uh, uh, information. Okay, perfect. And we also are uh, OWASP certified. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, this is actually, I think, a good question. Um, how do these solutions compare against HP ALM? It is a good question. So uh, a lot of uh, things. So, you know, I'm, I would confess I don't have all the latest details on uh, HP ALM, especially with the new lean UFT, uh, Lean FT product that uh, has just been released. But uh, if we compare it to the older versions with the QTP, it's a significant difference. You know, with QTP, most of your, uh, the cross-browser testing capability is very limited. Uh, so, you're, you know, you, it's great to run tests on IE, but with the other browsers, there's very limited support. And with Eureka and Sauce Labs, what you're really doing is moving all your testing infrastructure you know, to a SaaS and a cloud environment. You're taking away this headache of actually you know, having and managing this testing infrastructure and letting somebody else that does a much better job at that do it. And uh, also from a licensing point of view, you're not dealing with uh, expensive uh, licenses. I don't know the latest licensing uh, uh, methods for uh, HP for the Lean UF, Lean FT product, mm -hmm. but uh, if I compare against QTP, it's significantly lower in terms of uh, costs. Right, e exactly. Okay, well, with that, we have one minute left. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. Um, Badri, this was really helpful to a lot of people. Um, and to everyone, we are going to be sending that recording out along with the slides. Uh, you should look for that tomorrow morning via email. If you have any other questions at all, please email webinar at softlabs.com um, and we'll do our best to get in touch with you. Um, I'll also be working with Badri to get in touch with some of you who we were unable to get to some of those questions. Um, but thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks, Badri. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, everybody. Bye.